right, so if we want to understand human intelligence, or we want to understand how artificial intelligence could possibly happen, then we need to understand cognitive architecture. Now, has anyone here heard of the term cognitive architecture before? A few. Now, it's not that commonly heard. It's a little bit of an overlooked topic, but it actually turns out to be very important. Cognitive architecture really tries to bring together knowledge, pattern matching, and reasoning, which are the ingredients of intelligence. When we think about architecture, we normally think about buildings. Because buildings have architectures. We have walls and floors and ceilings and hallways and doors that create spaces for us to work and to live and play, and they channel our movements. They let us go some places, they invite us to some places, and create barriers for other places. So information systems can work the same way. We can think of a definition of architecture as the organization of structural and functional elements to achieve some purpose. So buildings have architectures, cities have architectures, uh, information systems have architectures, like we know about computer architecture, you know, networks have architectures. The brain has an architecture in terms of the cortical regions and the subcortical nuclei and how they're all wired together. And the mind has an architecture. Now the mind is not the same thing as the brain. We often say that the mind is what the brain does. The brain is a substrate that the mind rides on top of. So the mind is going to have some functional elements that work together in certain ways. It's going to have an architecture of its own. And if we can build um, artificial intelligence, it's also going to have some architecture. It's going to have functional elements that are wired together. It might or might not resemble the mind's architecture in various ways. But cognitive architecture is the study of these functional elements, how they fit together. Now, there's no textbook yet about cognitive architecture. It's um, a little bit of an overlooked field. Uh, there are maybe a thousand people in the world who have worked on architecture in one way out of hundreds of thousands who work on neuroscience or psychology or cognitive science or, or machine learning in various ways. But it's, I think, a key ingredient, and some people are starting to notice in the deep network world, the key ingredient that um, is going to require more attention. So here's the outline for what we're going to cover tonight. Before we get into cognitive architecture, we're going to step back and look at the architecture of information systems in general. <coughs> and we'll take just a brief history lesson about the history of the computational theory of mind. Then we'll work our way to the standard model of cognitive architecture, which is exemplified by the SOAR architecture. We'll take a, a look at that. And then we'll step back and consider a couple of important concepts that will give us some tools for thinking about how architecture works in general. Um, now, we'll compare cognitive architecture with architecture and deep learning networks. And then we'll focus in on one particular hard problem in cognitive architecture, which is about how the thing is controlled. Our thoughts, how does one thought lead to another? And finally, we'll close with a, a look at the architecture of cognitive, uh, conversational agents and how that has a form of cognitive architecture. All right, so the mind is the most complex device that we know of. Before we think about the architecture of the mind, let's think about the architecture of information systems more broadly. So what are some familiar information systems that were we know about, well, the book is one. A book has an architecture. It's, um, say it's a history book. The, the base of the architecture is a sequence of words. It's one word after another. And you can read a book, one word after another. But generally, we want to have other ways of accessing a book. Like a book is organized hierarchically by topics. In a history book, it's got different periods of history. So there's an architecture at work there. There's a table of contents that talks about what the organization is, what the hierarchical structure of the book is, so that you can go to a part where you want to. But there's a, a particular architectural element, the page number. The page number is the device that lets you decide where you want to go to and go to that page directly. Similarly, you have an index. An index is organized alphabetically so you can find the topic you want and you use a page number to get to the page you want to. And within pages, one page might refer to something on another page. Now notice that 
the, the functional elements here are all passive. They just sit on the page, and it's the active user that makes them come to life, that, makes, that gives them purpose. When you decide you want to go to a certain page, you flip to that page. And another device that has an architecture is a web page. Now let's start with the original HTML 1.0 web page. And do you remember what these look like? This is a simple line of, uh, of text, kind of quaint. Uh, maybe you can have a few, few figure, figures in there, but not very often. So uh, a web page is cool because it added one device to a linear stream of words, which is the hyperlink. So you could click on a hyperlink and it'll take you to another page automatically. So the computer is using a little bit of work there. It could be another page on the same website. It could just take you somewhere very different altogether. And that reduction of friction of how to get from one place to another made a huge difference. So that's why the web took off. But still, in HTML 1.0, the user is the active agent. And the web page just does a small amount of work in taking you to another page. But people try to put more and more action, more computation into websites. And there were a couple of bits and starts. There was JavaScript, uh, I'm mean, sorry, there was Java applets, and there was Flash, and those both had certain problems. But by now, we fast forwarded to the age of <coughs> HTML5, cascading style sheets, and JavaScript, and there's a lot more active elements in our web pages. So we've got navigation widgets. Um, so you can have carousel and sliders. You can have guided tours that kind of run automatically. You can conduct search to find things on the website. There's state, so the cookies, so that when you come back to a site, it'll show you something different. In fact, the cookies uh, know who you are and they reach out to databases. So the first time you come to a page, it might be different from what someone else sees because there's all this active computation going on back there. There's doors with locks, these passwords that let you go some things and not others. So we see that the web itself, as an information architecture, has taken on more sophisticated computational devices. All right, computers are devices with information architecture. So you see some pictures like this. A computer has got some functional elements. It's got I.O., it's got CPU, it's got memory. It's got two kinds of memory. It's got Hard long-term memory on your disk, and it's got short-term memory, the, the RAM and access memory. It's got two kinds of memory in another sense as well. Um, it's got data memory and program memory. These are functionally operate differently. The program memory is a fixed set of instructions that tells your active computing module what to do, and it operates against the data. So those are your files, your pictures, and so forth. Generally, the program memory we keep fixed, and the data is what changes. And often, if the program memory itself is changing, because you've got a virus. So normally, though, the, the act of computing is, uh, is, is done by the program and the CPU working together. <coughs> Another way of looking at computer architecture is by levels of abstraction. So at the bottom level, you have the circuits, the, 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 the transistors and, and circuits. You work up the firmware, up to device drivers, the parts of the operating system, libraries, and finally your, your application layer. So generally from the bottom to the top, the stuff down here does very little bit. Each part does a very small amount of work, very, very fast, very efficient. And as you move up, then you get more complex interactions between the parts at the bottom. So they're, they're doing more and more general things. It may take a little bit longer until the application layer that's where you write your programs and do all kinds of interesting stuff that you want to through multiple steps. All right, if we move from physical devices that we build to biological agents, um, every, every living thing starts with an architecture, an information architecture that looks like this. It's got an environment, and there's some sensing of the environment, and then the agent responds. So bacteria has got chemical sensors, some little something inside the cell causes it to secrete some other chemicals or grow in a certain direction. Plants behave like this. The plant senses where the light is coming from and it sends leaves in that direction to capture more energy. And certainly animals are the most interesting versions of this because they put nervous systems 
there where the action part is in order to coordinate the behavior to do better work of, uh, from what's perceived to uh, act on the environment more effectively. So a slightly more um, elaborate version of that has the uh, environment and close to some sense organs. Then there's something that coordinates the action. That's where all the interesting cognitive architecture stuff happens. And then the actions come out. If you're interested in robotics, you're probably more interested in the sense and the effectors. But we're interested in cognition, so it's that middle part that we're going to pay the most attention to. Now, it's, um, it's helpful when we want to think about how the mind works to consider the history of the thinking about how the mind works, what people thought in the past. So one of the interesting things to notice is that people think of, of the technology of the mind in terms of metaphors of the dominant technologies of their age. So people have been thinking about the mind for a long time. Before the 1800s, we called scientists natural philosophers. But modern science probably started around the uh, 1800s uh, when we had systematic um, experimentation and, and theories. So one of the guiding metaphors of the 1800s, of the industrial age, who, who can tell me what some of the important technologies were that gave rise to the industrial age? Electricity. Electricity. The steam engine. Sorry? Wheel. The, wheel, the wheel was around way before the <laughs> what, what ran along? So the steam engine powered trains. What ran along the train track for say with the next to the telegraph? Communication, the telegraph. Right? To say, okay, the train is left, the station's going to arrive at certain information. The telegraph is the dawn of uh, kind of information technology. So, the guiding metaphors of the 1800s for how the mind works were based on engines and hydraulics, the steam engine, and on signal transmission, which is what the telegraph was about. So, the, the thinkers then were people like Freud and Humboldt. So, Freud was uh, very interested in, in how the mind works and how, how uh, the psychology of the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. And he used the metaphors of engines and hydraulics. We thought about the unconscious mind as being a reservoir that holds energies and pressures that build up. And sometimes they get released and cause behaviors. So one way or another. Now, we don't normally talk in those terms today. We think that Freud's views are kind of antiquated. But is that really that off base? Like, Consider if you're, you're hungry or thirsty. That's kind of like a pressure that builds up, and then you it cause it draws your attention, and you think, okay, I got to get something to eat, and then you eat, and that relieves the pressure. So maybe those that metaphor makes sense. I mean, does it make sense more deeply psychologically? Like, suppose somebody yells at you, does that build up resentment? Now you're going to discharge in some way by yelling at someone else, or you get back. I don't know. That's all psychology, but it's. It's a metaphorical way of thinking about what goes on in the mind that can be useful. Another pioneer of psychology was uh, Hermann von Helmholtz. He was a student of how vision and hearing works. He, and, you know, what, what happens in the signal transmission from the eye to the brain. And he looked at neurons, he knew they were transmitting signals, and he wrote explicitly that the neurons are like telegraph wires transmitting a signal. And therefore you can measure how fast signal goes from your eye to your, to your brain, or from your, your brain to your hand to cause a movement. Another technology associated with telegraph was a form of memory. And actually Thomas Edison had a lot of his, his inventions around recording what was coming down the telegraph wire by marking on the paper. And that inspired William James, the founder of American Psychology, who was very interested in memory. You know, what's the nature of our experience and how do we remember things? And he wrote explicitly of memory as being like the recording of a signal on a telegram. So that, uh, that was what they were thinking about in the 1800s. And at the turn of the century, we have behaviorism. And this was um, started with Pavlov, you know, Pavlov's dog. When he'd ring a bell and feed the dog, and that, the dog made an association. So we got feedback. 
So behaviorism, behaviorism is the idea that um, it really rejects the idea of an internal psychology because you can't measure that very easily. So they just they said, listen, we just watch the behavior and we see that behavior is shaped by feedback. And by the way, that's kind of what how neural networks are, right? A neural network, you put some signal in, you get an output, and supervised learning means you give it a, a, a correction signal to change its behavior so it more adapts to what you want it to do. That's just roots way back to that. So 20th century, we we have the technologies of signal processing through radio, television, radar, and we have calculating machines. Some of these were driven by work. So calculating machines to calculate automatically, well, you know, if I launch the bomb in that direction, where's it gonna go? Or is the antibomb gonna work? So these technologies inspire thinking about how the mind works. Signal processing and feedback loops are really a dominant uh, the idea behind the idea of cybernetics, which is about how biological systems are controlled by feedback loops. Like there's a feedback loop that lets me keep my balance. Right. The, and calculating machines gave rise to the theory of computation through Turing and von Neumann, who said, okay, we can build machines that will automatically calculate very well. Now, can we make them do more than one kind of calculation? Can we actually make them do any kind of calculation we want to by giving them programs? instructions. So the von Neumann architecture is so the architecture that has the program memory and the data memory built out of foundation of calculating machines. So that gave people around the late 1940s the idea that, well, if we can build arbitrary calculating machines, maybe we can make machines that calculate as much as the mind has, so we can make artificial intelligence. So that gave rise to this field from the 1950s, artificial intelligence with um, McCarthy and Minsky, and that really took the computer as the technolog technological metaphor for how the mind works. That gave rise to the computational theory of mind and the field of cognitive science from the, around the 1950s, 1960s, um, looking at both how neurons work through Mulliken's hits. Um, no Chomsky did, uh, spelled out how grammars might work, so you might need a process language in comp computational theoretical sense. And um, Alan Newell and Herb Simon said, well, listen, if we have computer architectures, maybe we can have an architecture diagram for the mind itself. So that's where the, the, the uh, idea of cognitive architecture first, first to close. So there's been a lot of work on cognitive architecture since then, even despite the fact it's much smaller than things like neural networks these days. And it's converged to a kind of a standard model for what a cognitive architecture looks like. The standard model has got a couple parts to it. First, it starts with a perception action loop. So the environment gives rise to perceptions that go to common workspace that draws on knowledge resources. The idea here is there's a, there's a metaphor at work, and the metaphor is called the blackboard metaphor. The idea is that the ideas or thoughts that you carry in your mind are on a central workplace, this workspace that looks that operates like a blackboard, and that lots of other agents can look at it. In particular, the knowledge resources can look at the blackboard, and each one of them, more or less independently, can say, oh, do I recognize something there? Can I contribute? And they will write onto the blackboard themselves, or maybe erase things. And the knowledge resources long-term memory have different forms, like they're called declarative memory, procedural memory, semantic, episodic, skill memory. So these things are all ready to contribute to the blackboard. So one question to ask about this is the knowledge here passive or active? So there are different models, different cognitive arguments have a different view about whether the knowledge resource is just sitting there like knowledge in program memory, waiting for this active, something actively to reach out to it and bring it into to play, to participate on the blackboard. Or are these active knowledge watchers themselves that have computation to watch the blackboard and maybe decide when they apply and then weigh in on their own? So that's one question. But there are many, many questions that are raised by this, uh, by this general picture of a cognitive architecture. So here are three big questions that 
that we're going to focus on here today. Some of the biggest questions. First, what are the types of content that are held in the workspace? So think about what different kind of thought or experience you can have. There's percepts, beliefs, memories, goals, intentions and plans, emotions, attitudes. So one question is, are these all on the same workspace, or are there kind of divisions of the workspace? Maybe different specializations, like maybe it's an emotional kind of workspace, and a thinking workspace, a thought workspace, and maybe they talk to each other in some, in some way. So that's unknown. Another question. question is, what are the representations for state of knowledge? How do you represent your information? So one way of representing information that we know about neural networks is activation patterns over vectors of numbers, a combination of, of activation. Another way of representing state of knowledge is by graphs, objects, and relations, or links in a graph. And there are some other ideas as well, like frequencies of, of, of some phases of waveform. Third big question is how is processing control? So we know that a lot of what the brain does, and certainly with, and with the mind by extension does as well, is automatic. Like I can reach for my pencil and without thinking about all the complex signals sent to my, my motor system, it reads automatically. So how much of cognition, what goes on in the mind, is automatic, and how much it is under more deliberate control? This is a question. And then we have choices to make. Okay, I can decide to move over there, move over there. How does that deliberation happen? How does that choice conceive happen? So to, to, to answer questions like these, to address questions like these, people build actual computer models of cognitive architecture. So you're trying to instantiate that, that picture. And probably the, the one of the leading cognitive architectures is called the SOAR. This was started by uh, Alan Newell and John Blair in the 1980s, it's Blair's PhD thesis. And he, since then, he's been continuing to work on this at the University of Michigan. Uh, SOAR is a, not an acronym, by the way, that's its actual name. So one of the optional assignments was to download SOAR and work through the, um, the, uh, the first tutorial. Did anybody do that? Sorry. It's a lot of work. That's okay. Now, SOAR is really great because it's very well documented. So you can go to the website, download it, and try it. And it's got a very good tutorial. In fact, there's nine tutorials that you can work through. And it takes a long time to work through this because it's a very, very different way of thinking. And in fact, um, I'm told that a very smart writing student coming in takes about two months to become comfortable writing programs in SOAR as opposed to a standard computer language. And then it takes another two years of study before they can actually contribute to the platform themselves. So there's a lot going on there. There's a, there's a small spin-off company called SORTEC that actually writes practical applications out of this sort of architecture. But uh, the academic version is, is open for use. So I've got three slides about SOAR. And here's a preview. First of all, SOAR's definition of intelligence. SOAR's definition of intelligence is that it's problem solving. Through search through a problem space. Or a, a state of search, a problem state space. Second, the representation, representation so we're in terms of graphs of objects and relations among them. And third, control in SOAR is by a production system. So that's a blackboard. The blackboard's got very two kinds of rules, procedural rules, and, uh, knowledge rules, and declarative knowledge rules that correspond to long-term memory. They're watching, these rules are watching the blackboard and they modify the blackboard in response. So let's first look at SOAR's definition of intelligence. So <clears throat> intelligence, according to SOAR, and a lot of AI, is problem solving by searching a state space. Now a good illustration of that, and this is in the first tutorial we worked through if you go to the SOAR site, is the, the jug problem. The idea here is that you have a problem. The, the, the problem is you start with some empty jugs, a five gallon jug and a three gallon jug, and you have a faucet, you fill the jugs, and you have a sink you can pour the jugs out into, and you can pour from one jug to another. But whenever you pour, you have to pour all the water you can without spilling over. No, there's no measure. And the goal is to get 
the three gallon jug to have one gallon of water in it. So imagine that problem. How would you solve that problem? Easy. Let's give it a try. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> All right, I've got a five gallon jug and a three gallon jug. So the rule of the game is I fill the jug with water and I can empty it out. Or I can pour from one jug to the other, but I have to pour all the water I can without spilling over. So there's going to be some kind of arithmetic going on, right? Okay. Five and three. So we're going to have some combination of five and three. All right, where do I start? What do I do? Yes? You have three gallon jug. And pour it into five gallon jug. All right, three to five. Now what? One more time, same thing. All right, three gallon jug, five gallon jug. Okay, so. Uh, just... All right, so now I've got. <laughs> so now I have one, one gallon and three gallon jug. That is excellent. Have you done this? Have you done this one before? No. Can anybody think of a different solution? Let's start with this one. Start filling the five gallon jug. And let's pour that in a three gallon jug. So I've got three and two. Now I'm not going to pour back. That would be kind of dumb. So I'll pour the two into the three gallon jug. Now let me do this again. So now I've got five and I pour one. So now I've got four over here. Now I can think of four and three. So Pour that out. Now I do four minus three. That gives me one in this jug, the five gallon jug. So this is another path. So now I've got one gallon in the three gallon jug. Sorry? It took longer. That's right. So how do we how can we think about this kind of a problem? Well, in SOAR, you think about it in terms of a graph, a state graph, a problem state graph. So the problem state graph, we've got our Starting state, empty jugs, and our goal states. And there's two goal states. One where the three gallon jug has got one gallon in it, and the other one it's uh, one where the five gallon jug is full, and the other with five gallon jug is empty. And, and the links in this graph are these operations, fill and pour. So if you're looking at this graph right here on the screen, you can see, oh yeah, the best path is to go this way. And that's what that gentleman saw immediately in his mind. It's from here to there. The second route, I took a long way around. I filled the five gallon jug and did, did these other longer set of operations. So the problem state graph is what SOAR is SOAR's representation that it's going to use for thinking about how to solve a problem. It's going to conduct operations, these fill and pour operations. Okay, so that's the problem state. Now, what about representation? So representation is always also done in terms of a graph. This is a different graph. This is called the workspace state graph. So this is going to have data objects on it, and operators, and attributes and relations. This represents the, work, the working memory or the, the state of knowledge, uh, the state of the current uh, workspace. So some of the items on the, on the workspace can be a representation for the jugs. So we've got jug one and jug two, and each of them has a different capacity, five gallons or three gallons, and a current content. So what's how much water is in the jug right now? And there's also this virtual jug here, which is a goal state, which says a goal is the capacity, the three gallon jug has got one gallon in it. So there's going to be some rules operating in the background now. Always watching to see if one of the Virtual, one of the uh, model jugs matches our goal jug. And if these numbers line up, then we say we've solved the problem. So that's how we represent the state of the world. How about the operators? Those are also represented as objects on the graph with these link, these operator links that link to operations you can do, like the pour operation. So the pour operation has got some arguments. It says we're pouring from one jug, maybe jug one, to jug two. Now there's other rules operating that say, well listen, this pour operator is only valid if there's some water in jug one. And if we start off with one jug one <coughs> being empty, 
then, then that, this operator will not be allowed on the workspace. But the fill operator would be allowed. So once this, this object, this operator node is on the workspace, then other rules can act to execute the operator and actually virtually perform this operation of pouring from one transfer water from one jug to another. Some other rules will say, okay, if I pour water from one jug to another, then how much remaining capacity is there? So that may be some of their arguments on the workspace. So, yes? Just to, 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 to uh, embellish for the uh, students here, uh, so this kind of problem uh, you wouldn't do with a neural network. And, um, uh, so, so can you compare and contrast with this approach? Why does the neural network work? <coughs> Um, in a little while, we'll look at a comparison between this kind of architecture and the neural network architecture, and we'll take that under consideration. Yes. Okay, so that's a question of representation. That's a good question. We'll get into that. Okay, the third big question of how your architecture is controlled. How does it decide what to do? So, the SOAR, the uh, control is a production system. So a production system is a blackboard metaphor. You've got some um, place where data is stored or the current state is stored, and there's these rules that watch the blackboard and make modifications. Now, it turns out that production systems are very common in artificial intelligence. Uh, there's, there's a whole different variety of them. But they're actually very difficult to write because the rules, you have to make sure the rules only fire when they're supposed to and not when they're not supposed to. So it's actually very easy in a production system to have rules that end up going around in circles or end up getting wedged, stuck, nothing else can apply, or that build these big tangled nests and you can never figure out how to, how to get out of them. So SOAR offers some technologies to try to make this, the rules a little bit easier to manage. It's got two levels of rules. It's got some automatic rules that kind of operate in the background to do housekeeping, more or less. So for example, um, rules will apply whenever ever some input comes in, and they'll reach out to knowledge and say, how do we interpret that input? There's a three-phase cycle that operates. So there's some automatic background rules that apply here, and they apply at the third phase. And the goal of the first phase is to propose some so, some operators that might apply to the to uh, be on the blackboard. And only one operator can be on the blackboard at a time. So there's a, a, a second the second phase of, of a set of rules that will select which operator to apply. And when that operator is applied, it's the more back you know, the housekeeping rules operate to clean up and take care of all the implications of that rule. And this goes around in a cycle. The idea that this cycle uh, takes about 50 milliseconds, so around 20 hertz. So the idea is here that your mind is actually operating in about a 20 hertz cycle. And this is way below the level of consciousness. You'll never be able to be aware of this happening. It's happening automatically underneath. But what you might become aware of is perhaps <coughs> operators or groups of operators that correspond to intentions and things you, you actually conduct in the world. So this model, or this processing cycle in a workspace, is intended to achieve the functions of um, executive function. Executive function is a set of theories in psychology and cognitive neuroscience about how a mind can maintain itself and conduct day-to-day -day life effectively. And there are three basic ideas of executive function, or, or functions that have to be Perform. First of all, you have to be able to take in new information from the sensors and process it, interpret it. Look up what does that mean in terms of long term memory. <laughs> Second, you need to be able to focus attention. That means keep only the stuff on your working memory blackboard that is relevant to your current task. And don't get it piled up with lots and lots of extra data that you can waste time churning on. And third, you need to shift your task context sometimes. So that means you have whatever you're working on, sometimes you have to table that, put it aside, 
work on some other problem as an interrupt. When you're done with that, put it back and bring this back off the stack to return to what you were doing. So those are uh, uh, properties of executive function that psychologists have tests for to see whether you've got a brain disease or whether you're, you're, you, you've got a hormonal imbalance, things like that. So SOAR is designed to support executive function. And th there's a metaphor here which is called an executive or someone who's in control of some resources. You can think about the captain of the starship as being an executive who's got some resources at their disposal. They've got sensors, they've got long-term knowledge, and they've got actuators, things that they can do. So maybe some pe people remember this, this episode. The sensor, Uhura, reported, Captain, there's a Klingon formation approaching. So Captain Kirk said, OK, I've got to process that. And he said, Sulu, do, what do we know about this formation? Have we seen it before? And Sulu said, yes, Captain. It was a 22nd century space opera, and the protagonists like flowers. But the captain has to keep junk off of the long-term memory, decide what's relevant and what's not. He said, Sulu, I know about that space opera. It's not relevant here. So keep the, keep the workspace focused on the task. But sometimes the captain has to take an error. Captain, here's the mocha you ordered. Mmm. Thank you, Innocent. Does it have whipped cream? Yes, Captain, it does. Ah, oh, very good. Thank you. All right, then pop that off the stack. Get back to the task at hand. Uhura, how fast is the formation moving? So if you can do that executive function yourself, then you could be a starship captain with your mind operating as a cognitive architecture the blackboard metaphor. All right. So we've seen architecture and information systems, some history, the computational theory of mind, and the standard model of cognitive architecture, which is exemplified by SOAR. Now I want to dive into two very interesting and important concepts that give us better tools for thinking about cognitive architecture. But first, let's think about Rajan's question. If SOAR and cognitive architectures built on production systems are supposed to be a model for how the mind works, and they have these working memory patterns and these rules in the background, then where are the neurons? Because there's this common idea that the brain and the mind are so wonderful. The mind works on the brain, and the brain has got this massively parallel distributed processing, and that's the key to our intelligence. So how could this thing with no neurons, no massively parallel anything, how could that possibly be a model for the mind? Well, the, the key idea here is levels of abstraction. Level of abstraction in computational systems was best articulated by David Marr. David Marr was a theoretical neuroscientist. And in the late 1960s, early 70s, he wrote some very influential papers about what neurons are doing. He looked at different cortical regions, looked at the wiring, and he made these theories that, OK, it's computing this or computing that. But then in the 1970s, he had a radical transition. He changed from being a theoretical neuroscientist to being a theorist of computational intelligence. So the difference is, neuroscience, theoretical neuroscience is what are, the compute, what are the neurons computing? Computational intelligence is about why they're computing that. What is it that <coughs> makes those computations a good thing to do? So Marr articulated three levels of abstraction to help to understand this. One level is called computational theory. And that says, what is the computation? What's the purpose of the computation first? And by what principles can it be accomplished? What is it about the world that we can do computing to achieve our goals? Often the computational theory level has got mathematical models associated with it. Math about the world and math about things you can do to compute good actions. 
second level of abstraction is called the algorithm level. That says that if you have some math or some theory you want to accomplish, you still need, if you're going to put that into a computation, you have to choose representations. And you have to apply calculations to transform the information. So what representations do you use? And what are the algorithms to carry forth the computation that the theory says you should be doing? And the third level of abstraction is implementation. And this is about the physical hardware and firmware that your algorithm runs on. So it could be a given computational theory can be instantiated in multiple algorithms. And the same algorithm can actually be implemented on different kinds of hardware. An example. Let's see an example. Let's take our, our book, history book, our textbook. So what's the computational theory of a book? Well, the purpose is to make the information available to a reader both linearly, but also in more structured access. So they can access the information by topic or by, um, by theme. So the computational theory says we're going to give an, an indexing scheme, some way of getting, of, of, of displaying the hierarchical structure and the topic structure and giving you an index into the text itself. Could be a number of things. It happens to be page number in a physical book. What's an algorithm that will carry out that computational theory? Well, one is a physical book itself, but here's a different algorithm. Suppose you have a scrolling mechanism, and each word has a number on it, and your table of contents is a keyboard, and you punch a place on the keyboard, that scrolls to the word that, the section with the word that you're looking for. So that's a different algorithm from having page numbers in the book. So what's an implementation of this kind of algorithm? Well, one way would be actually to have this Victorian piano rule type of thing that physically has gears and knobs and you press a physical keyboard and it rolls to the part we want. Another implementation, very different, is in a computer. You can have widgets in your, in your iPhone and you, you kind of scroll to the part that you want. So the idea is that there that if you look at these different levels of abstraction, we can understand a computational system, maybe in terms of neurons at one level, but what the neurons are doing is a totally different level, and it might be instantiable by a very different kind of algorithm. So indeed, according to the, this, uh, uh, these levels of abstraction, it's possible, not you can't rule it out, that a mind could be built with a production system, and also with neurons, that in some fashion are doing comparable things understand in more detail what the neurons are doing that's comparable to what the uh, graphs and links and pointers in a, in a, in a, uh, a sort of system would be. Alright, so that's one abstract idea. And here's the other abstract idea also comes in threes, and that's about level of sophistication of a computational system. Plus for the by identify three levels of sophistication. I'm going to focus on only two. The three levels are a reactive process. A reactive process is one where the sensor gets to deliver some perception and the action is computed straight through, pretty much automatically. There's very little in the way of memory or um, state. A deliberative agent is built on top of a reactive agent. So it has reactive processes, but it also has state inside of it. So it might have some memory of where we are in the world. What did we just last do? And it might have um, the ability, a whiteboard or a blackboard, so you can do planning. You can pretend you're in one place or another. It might seek out long-term memory. Write to memory and read from memory. The third kind of agent is a reflective agent. A reflective agent not only can think about the world and your planning and kind of state, but it also thinks about its own reasoning processes, it tries deliberately to modify the way it learns. It learns. So we won't spend time on the reflective agent. Um, that's an interesting topic. If you want to look more into it, but there's a lot of material just paying attention to the difference between a reactive agent 
and a deliberative agent. So the reactive agent is automatic, strictly determined computation. A deliberative agent is designed so that it has choices and you can kind of see it presented to it and you make decisions between the choices. Reactive agent has very modest internal state, if any. A deliberative agent can have a lot of internal state. A reactive agent doesn't have explicit world models. There are, anything it knows about the world is just implicit in whatever is represented in, in the stages of automatic computation. A deliberative agent might have some model of the external world. And if you know about Daniel Kahneman's um, system one, system two type of thinking, reactive is, would be system one, automatic. A deliberative agent would be something where you think over multiple terms. So just for an example, an example of a reactive agent, suppose you want to control the temperature of a building. What's a building temperature control system? A reactive example is a thermostat. Just got two inputs, the current temperature and your set point. It does a simple computation, it compares those, and if the temperature is too low, it turns on the heat. Very straightforward. How about the deliberative building controls management system? Well, this might have a model of the building, of how it gets warmed by the sun, what happens when the wind blows, when people come into it. And that model can be used in a predictive controller. So that it can look ahead and pretend, well, what if we preheat the building or pre-chill the building so that when the sun rises, that we're already cool on one side and warm on the other. So this would be a deliberative type of building management control system. All right, what kind of an agent is SOAR? Is it reactive or deliberative? So SOAR, it sets itself up to make choices. Right? It chooses, am I going to build the uh, five gallon jug or the three gallon jug or four? So those are operations that can be placed on the that are, can be made available to the, the workspace, and then it'll execute which one is placed there. It has a rich internal state because it does have these models of jugs in the, and the goal state that vary over time. And it's got this world model because the model of the world is, well, how much water is in each of our jugs? So yeah, SOAR is a deliberative agent. Now, can we write a SOAR program in a reactive fashion? Yeah, we can. We can write a set of rules which are explicitly, if the state is empty, then we fill three. And if the state is the result of that, so we can write rules in SOAR that will take us directly from the starting state to the goal state in a reactive fashion, not really thinking or think, making any choices. But the, the drawback of this is it only solves this one problem. And if you want to solve a different problem, like you have a six gallon jug and a three gallon jug, then, or a seven gallon jug, well, you, you have to write another deliberate program. Whereas SOAR is designed to uh, explore the space. Now SOAR itself, as the deliberate agent, um, might use different strategies to search the search space. Um, in the initial tutorial, it just does these core operations at random until it finally detects if it has found the solution or not. So it can take hundreds of trials. But a lot of what goes on in a <coughs> cognitive architecture or a search system like that is to design heuristics or good ways of sniffing out what direction to go in to achieve the goal. So that's where the smarts comes in. But it can be really dumb but fast in a um, reactive system as well, if it wants to be. <laughs> and how about a neural network architecture? Is that reactive or deliberative? Let's, let's consider what the, ar the, the architecture is of a neural network compared to a cognitive architecture. So this is the architecture of AlexNet, which um, I'm familiar mentioned. It's um, an image classification. Uh, network. So you put an image in, and out 
the, uh, the output comes the category of what, what is that an image of. And the, this is a deep network. It's got multiple layers, and each layer has got these convolution. From the early layers, you've got convolutional layers, which means they shared weights. So all of the weights for computing this value are the same as if you compute this value applied to a different patch of the image. Um, and then at the end, it's, it's fully connected. So what's the computational theory of a convolutional network? Why is this a good architecture for image classification? Any ideas? What is it about images in the world that makes it a good idea to do this? Images have features. Convolution is the way to pick up those features. Convolution is the way to pick up features. So, yes. Yeah. And then at the lower level, the pixels that are next to each other are connected. The pixels are related to one another. So that's why the window is compact. So you're looking locally. And why, why, are the, why do we have the shared weights? The same set of weights if you put the, the image patch here or over there. What is that? So here's another observation about the world, which is that an object can appear in an image anywhere. Now, you want your network to recognize an object no matter where it appears in the image. An image is pretty big compared to the size of the object. Now, there, if you have a fully connected network here, you have a lot of parameters. And you have to train the parameters for every position of the object no matter where it occurs in the image. That's a lot of training examples, a lot of parameters to learn. But the observation here is that there's this invariance. The object looks the same no matter where it is. So therefore, if you train a little patch for the object in one place, well, those, that'll still pick up the same object or object feature somewhere else. So there's this translation invariance property that makes convolution a good thing to do. And the other property is there, that, uh, of the world is that objects are made of visual features. So bicycle has got wheel, seat, and so forth. And they're similar among different bicycles, maybe resemble the wheel of a, of a motorcycle. So notice that there's multiple um, layers. Uh, and each one of these macro layers is multiple network layers inside of there. 96, 224, 96, 384. So this enables the network to pick up different features so that at any, at any level, one can specialize on the bicycle wheel, or another on the seat, and so forth. Whatever the visual features are of objects. And through the magic of backpropagation and supervised learning, if you just give it this basic structure, it's designed to be able to fall into place and find the features that apply uniformly or regularly across uh, objects that can occur anywhere in the image. That's why convolutional architecture is a good idea for, uh, for image classification, and other architectures are good for other problems, like sequence problems. And we'll see that next week when we do natural image processing. All right, so is AlexNet, this convolutional, um, convolutional um, network, is that reactive or deliberative? Okay, so the proposal is if it's trained, it's deliberative. All right, well, let's see. So let's suppose it's been trained up. Does it make any choices? Are there any choices apparent here? Well, I mean, what happens, what gets computed is automatic. Okay, I put in some numbers, and there's, there's, there's weights. You multiply the weights, and you go through the activation function, and now you get another set of numbers. So there's no, there's no blackboard there where you can put different alternatives. Is there internal state? Well, the only th the thing starts differently every time you put a new image in. When it gets computer, it's just a function of the initial image. There's no memory of the previous images. Is, 
Is the representation implicit or explicit? Well, it's hard to know. Like, actually, one of the problems with neural networks is it's hard to know what actually is being represented by any given activation of any unit in here. But there's no, no state, no choices being made. It's just automatic. You put some information in, and it comes out. What the parameters, once it's trained up, the parameters are fixed. Nothing else changes. So I think we have to say that a neural network architecture, at least this one, is a reactive agent. It's not really deliberative. Yes? I was curious if the weights uh, that you change for the model can you treat that as a state? The weights are not really state. The weights are parameters that remain fixed. Once it's trained, the weights are just there. It's just like, okay, now I know what I'm going to do with the next, next image that comes in. I'm just going to multiply and activate all the way through. Ta da, I'm done. There's no cycling, nothing. Now, there are neural network architectures that feed the output back into the input called recurrent networks. So they do have an idea of maintaining state, like an LSTM network. And we'll, I'll talk about LSTMs and recurrent networks next week, because they've come into play in natural language processing. But for this particular architecture for image processing, this is reactive. Now, I used to work in computer vision. And I can tell you that a lot of people put a lot of work into engineering deliberative architectures for computer vision, where we would compute some features and then make some proposals. How do the features fit together? Try one way or another way to figure out if they fit a model. But in the past less than 10 years, these convolutional networks have just blown all the other techniques out of the water. So how do you think that makes an old computer vision guy feel? The, the, the simplest kind of architecture, this unsophisticated reactive architecture, beats the pants off of any deliberative architecture that we work so hard on. What does that tell us about? So, for the number of parameters, they are a lot more than your deliberative kind of check, right? There's a lot of parameters. There's a lot of parameters. A lot of parameters. Millions of parameters. And all those computer vision, traditional techniques, I think fewer, right? A lot fewer a lot parameters. parameters. A lot fewer. Right. But the architecture of whether it's deliberate or reactive is fundamentally different. There's no choices here, it just pumps on through. So what that tells us is that we're, we need to think about the problems that deliberative and reactive architectures are good at or not so good at, and maybe slightly different terms. Now, there are problems that the neural network might not be so good at, like maybe the, uh, the chunk problem, because that's a very large search space. And you'll never have trained on uh, enough examples, perhaps, to be able to put a new problem in and have figure out, just by a reactive system, well, what would be the right combination of, of pores? You'd have to work out what's your representation, how do you represent it, pouring, and the multiple steps of pouring and, and the output. So a, a neural network architect, are very good at saying, well, which, which category is it? That's a fixed set of activations coming up with that. But if your output actually means a number of steps, and it might be a different number of steps for a different, for a different problem, that probably this reactive architecture is not going to do that. So is, it also, so is it also true that you can understand what you've done in a deliberative network, but you don't understand what's done in one of these reactive neural networks? Well, um, not exactly. Maybe. I mean, that's um, empirically kind of where we are now, but it's not a rule. It doesn't have to be that way. So in a deliberative system, if it's written with rules, like uh, SOAR is, then you can easily follow what to do and why. Now, you might not understand exactly. It might take a lot of work to figure out, well, how did we get from here to there? You might have to, and there's a lot of tools for trying to diagnose. Why did this production system produce what it produced? And it can be difficult to decipher a complex set of production rules. In a um, reactive architecture like this, there are techniques for trying to understand what each unit is computing. Like, one of the things you can do is you can say, well, um, if I light up this unit right here, and I propagate backwards and say, well, what is the image, an image that will cause this unit to fire? Then you can generate what that feature looks like. Those are called inception systems sometimes. And you've seen maybe synthesized images which, are, which kind of reveal what some of these units appear to be doing. Uh, but by and large, it's very hard to understand. 
So that's just where we're at right now. But people are working on it all the time to make them more transparent, because transparency in AI is a big thing. If I were determined, if I were to see the problems, it's so complex and sort of occupation is to be active. If I can figure out how the test state transition and do the logical diagram, it's dead. Um, to some extent, here's, here's what I would say. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a slide that will address what the neural networks are really good at in a second. So we'll get back to that. Another question. Was there another question? Well, just an observation that at the 20 hertz rate that your SOAR model was running, you yeah. would never get an answer from the top model, right? We all need that. Uh, this model? Because you're, the time it would take to actually do all of those operations at such a slow rate. Uh, well, this can be done very fast if you have enough computing hardware. Yeah, that's my point. Is that, that the top model is well suited to high, high oh, rates, high I see. processing power. Whereas the deliberative model in the store that you were talking about, you were talking about 20 hertz. Well, it's a question of how many steps there are. Right. Now, if you think of the jump problem, you know, um, do you solve it as fast as you can recognize a person's face? No, you probably think about it a little bit. You think ahead a few steps, just like playing chess. So that would be a good fit for a deliberative, multi-step sort of a, a, a process. Yes, sir. So, autonomous, I mean, a self-driving car and self-driving vehicles, and deliberative, because they are very much state-based. Where you are and where you're coming from. Well, they have an input state that that's that you could view that they could be reactive in that you have some input, which is what you measure right now. Where am I? And you have some some neural network. Maybe, maybe it looks up in the knowledge base and puts puts in well. Here's our map of the current world as part of the additional input. And you say, well, how do we put these together? Or uh, it's, it's probably I don't know what the architectures are of those. I'm told that they do not actually maintain a lot of state from one cycle to the next. They actually kind of wake up one instance to another, at least some of the, some of the companies doing that, but <laughs> they're not very transparent about exactly what their architecture really are. So the act of the Uber active, they actually broke the delivery components the Volvo actually had a uh, <coughs> collision avoidance system. They switched it off to, uh, to allow their uh, uh, the, the reactive uh, image processing systems to take priority. Yeah, so generally... They actually protected the people, no problem. Yeah, generally your AI system is going to be a very complex architecture with lots of parts, you know, fail-safe systems, backup systems, and so forth. That's going to be... And, and the modules might look like this. But you'll have a number of these modules that kind of get assembled together, including, uh, you know, how confident are we? And that's, that's what they turn off in that sort of situation. That was another question. Yes. Well, I sort of had the same comment that at the high level, you know, the self-driving car, you need to go from A to B through a series of turns and so on, will be very deliberative. But on the way there, the white collision is probably will be quite reactive. Right. So there's going to be some sort of path planning that goes on, you know, and so that will be some intermediate states, maybe, and maybe those will get turned into an input to a reactive part. That could have operate in the moment. I just need to get to the next. But aren't those species of reactive, you know, in that state? I mean, wait, what state in the distinction? So let's say, you know, you process an image, yeah. make a decision, and then you get into a next reactive state as an applied rates. Why is that deliberate and not? It's an input into yet another reactive system. Um, Right, so the so questions are, it's an internal state. So once you go through one cycle, does the output of that, your, your next state, does that contribute to what you, to the next reactive state or the next part of the cycle? So in our minds, we keep, we keep our intentions and goals in mind all the time, you know, through, through the cycle, as opposed to waking up brand new and saying, here's a new image, what do you think this is? Here's a new image, what do you think this is? Now, interestingly, you know, there, and in theories of computer vision, there's a lot of questions about what about top-down influence versus bottom-up influence. So some theories say, well, we have a lot of 
preconceptions about what we're looking at that helps us interpret what we're seeing. On the other hand, you can watch television, and it will just rapidly put you know, one image of something and something else very different right in front of you, and you, in, you know, very, very quickly can see what it is. So that shows that we don't have to have a lot of top-down knowledge or information in order to interpret the next scene that we see. It can be much more rapid like this. Do you think that, as a good analogy, reactive systems are more like our subconscious mind and deliberative more functions? So for example, as humans, if I see something, I'm not thinking, oh, that's a computer. I just know, like my subconscious is telling me, that's reactive and then deliberative is more something that I actually think through. Yeah, that would correspond to the kind of a uh, system one. So his, his view is that, yes, immediate pattern matching, some input, kind of idea, have an intuition immediately what to do about it. That would be his system one. System two is when you stop back and you think, you allow other ideas to percolate in, you weigh them against one another. Yes. So system one for humans is far more efficient than system two. It's very fast. Very good. Do you think that over time we will lose some of our communication systems to be more reactive to make them quicker? Um, actually, that's part of the learning mechanism in SOAR. So, so some of the ideas of these cognitive architectures is that when you first solve a problem, you do a lot of work to deliberatively work at an answer, but then you store that and you store kind of a shortcut. So if you see the problem again, then you just fast forward to what you what you computed before. So yes, that's part of learning. And part of learning, you know, in cognitive science, we know that we have this idea called called chunking, where we take a series of steps or a, a complex array, and we kind of bundle that up as a unit so that we can invoke it all at once without recomputing the whole thing again later on. That's how we that's how we learn to do things automatically. All the steps I learned you know, to drive a car, you know, okay, I have to turn left, turn the blinker, that becomes automatic and available to, in a more reactive way from an intentional system that is more conscious, but everything else happens automatically and consciously. So, that I was just going to make a comment that said, I think he made that earlier. So the essential difference between the two that remains is are you in a training state versus an active action state? No, training is totally is factored away from this. So, so we talked about learning things, but this um, deliberative, that can have learning in it, but this also might have a, a learning stage where you learn the reactive, uh, where you learn the parameters, like in, the, uh, in a convolutional network. But once it's learned, then it's, it just goes. Yes, yeah. Do you have any examples of real-world problems that SORA has been used to solve? Um, I know that it's, it's used in, in, in uh, the Defense Department. They've got a number of contracts there. Yeah. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know the details. Uh, I think you can go to the SORA Tech uh, website. But there are a lot of logistic problems that um, can be solved with classical operations research techniques. But if there's a lot of parameters and mixed types of data, then something like SOAR might be good at that. They try to use SOAR for natural language, and there's they have these conferences, so you can see applications. I don't know, know them offhand, any of the, the most spectacular uh, <coughs> ones. So you, were you early enough that there could be a higher system where a SOAR can pretty much just stay, maybe we should be a reactive system? There are a lot of cognitive architectures, and certainly you can do hybrids of these. In fact, some of the cognitive architectures um, that are um, you know, in the classical AI community, they, they recognize the value of some of the reactive systems and neural networks. And so they, tr they attempt to make part of the representations be vectors of activations as opposed to graphs. Not all classical cognitive architectures have graphs. And that allows better pattern matching for uh, and, and exploiting um, Sub-architectures like this. So yes, there can be hybrids. Yes. yes. So there's a lot of work on that uh, aircraft collision avoidance, right? They're using Marco state decision tables on that rather than aircraft collision avoidance. Yes. Um, I read the talk here actually regarding that. And that's the new model for collision avoidance for aircraft, especially in 
then eventually be used in uh, uh, self-driving cars. Um, so that's a whole bunch of states and a, predict, a way to predict, right, where the where the vehicles or the airplanes will go to then uh, recommend the way to avoid. Yeah, you could do prediction with the reactive uh, you know, uh, uh, neural network as well. <laughs> it depends upon if you have enough training examples. So one way to think about neural networks is they're really good at interpolation. If you have some set of a lot of training data that covers some space, then you can predict other things that occur inside that space. But they're not so good at extrapolation where you have new things that you've never seen before, you've never seen anything like it before, but you need to use principles like cause, cause, causality. Uh, you know, what happens if I get from here to there and, and imagination? Okay, this is a new state I've never, nothing like I've seen before. Now what can happen? That's where you would go to a more deliberate type of, uh, of architecture. Yeah. I was curious, uh, I was curious about your comments about the uh, quality or inequality of solar architecture and the neural Turing machines. Neural Turing machine. Uh, let me table that till later. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to need that. I did it okay. oh, oh. Make more good material. Uh, it got very top of the cool, uh, you know, It's up to you. Uh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna have an exercise in a few minutes um, that will combine with brick. <laughs> All right. So let's back up a bit and look at the ingredients of intelligence and see how uh, to where, where we're at. Intelligence requires knowledge, pattern matching, and reasoning. These are the three pillars. So knowledge is uh, facts and information in some organized structure. And in AI world, um, there's a lot of work in data mining in the modern world, and also knowledge graphs. And well, graphs are a way of representing information, as we've seen in SOAR, we can represent a lot of knowledge in the world through graphs, and we'll see that next week when we talk about question and answering. Pattern matching is to be able to take some input and figure out if it matches something you've seen before or something you know about when it's not a perfect match. If there's a perfect match, it's trivial to look up in a database, but in vision and speech and lots of signal type domains, you never get a perfect match. You never see exactly what you saw before. So you have to have this inexact matching. That's what pattern matching is about. And the reasoning is taking some information and some principles or rules and applying it to arrive at new assertions, new information. So in AI, there are AI systems that can reason much better than people for certain kinds of optimization problems and planning problems. Like if you're running an airline and you want to know, you know how to route the planes, then AI can do that much better than people can, but very specialized, very neural. Uh, goals. Now, where does machine learning fit in? For the most part, machine learning applies to the pattern matching side. And this is where the big revolution has been in deep networks. It's computer vision and speech used to be really, really hard for computers, and now computers are really catching up quite remarkably for certain formulations of these problems. And we put neural networks and machine learning together with knowledge, we get predictive analytics. And this is where the biggest impact is of AI these days. So apply predictions or structural analysis to databases that you've collected, you have a knowledge representation, and you can predict new things. And they forecast and trends and say how many widgets you're likely to sell this year based on past, the past. If you have enough data, you can be interpolated. Natural language understanding really falls between all these three. And so next week we'll talk about natural language understanding and we'll see why it's so hard because AI has really not been successful at pulling all three of these ingredients together in a unified framework. But that's really what cognitive architecture tends to do, is it's, you know, it's, it's trying to pull, pull them all together. Okay. So we see some history, we've seen uh, these concepts, the big picture, the ingredients of knowledge. Now we're going to return to cognitive architecture, some of the big problems, and we're going to focus on one particular problem. So there's a lot of issues that 
these many, many cognitive architectures that people have built are addressing, like, where does the knowledge reside? What forms of long-term memory are there? How is state represented and utilized? Is it activation? Is it crafts? What are the different forms of memory? I mean, there, is there procedural memory, things we know how to do, episodic memory, events that we can place in, in, in space and time, semantic memory, things that we just know, but we don't know how we know it, but we can articulate it. Uh, localist versus distributed representation. So in a graph, it's very local in the information. A no network, activation is very distributed. The control vector, what do we think and do next? The difference between control, program control, and data <coughs> and how learning happens. So we're going to focus on one of the really interesting questions is how do we decide what to think next? Think yoga for a second. Think about your breathing. Okay, so thoughts come into your mind, and another thought happens. Your mind wanders around. Think of yourself as a butterfly floating in the breeze. You're a butterfly, and it's, oh, there's some nice shade over there. There's a flower I might want to land on. And there's another butterfly. I might like to another butterfly. How does the butterfly decide what to do? Well, the breeze kind of pushes it in one direction and the flower catches it. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll go in that one. So your, your thoughts can go in many different directions. A deliberative architecture like SOAR is designed to make this explicit. SOAR can have a number of options. Which jump do I pour or fill? And there's some mechanism for choosing which direction to go in, and the other thoughts fall by the wayside. The other directions go. So how does this happen? That's a very interesting question that people really have, have struggled over and have a, a lot of interesting ideas about. Now, one of the popular cognitive architectures that explores this question is called LIDA. So LIDA is very complex. You can see it's got, like this, the SOAR architecture, it's got a lot of pieces. It's very ambitious about emulating the human mind. Some cognitive architectures are really intended to be more AI agents. Some are intended to really replicate what the human mind does. So I'm not going to go through all of this, these details, but just read what some of these modules are. There's different kinds of memory. There's different kinds of learning. There's a perception action loop. I mean, here's the environment. Input comes in, stuff happens, and the output comes out. And there's some other words here. Oh, look at this. Lida uses the C word, conscious. Conscious. You don't see that word very much in science. When I was an undergrad, I worked in a neurobiology lab. I was reading the papers, and I asked my professor and said, you know, I'm reading all these papers about neurobiology. And then I'm telling me what I really care about. How does consciousness work? And he said, son, you're right. In science, we do not have a good idea of what consciousness is. We don't know how to measure it. We don't talk about it in polite company. <laughs> <laughs> that was gratified at a conference many years later. I saw him give a talk, and he said, you know, the undergraduates ask us what consciousness is, and we don't have an answer, and it's kind of embarrassing. But in about the last 20 years, serious scientists have actually started using the C word and making theories about how consciousness works. There is no theory that is really at all converged on that is really satisfying. It's still deeply mysterious. However, the line of cognitive architecture takes a stab at it. And when they, they use this word colet here, and the idea of this cognitive architecture is that Attention is very important. Attention is deeply tied to your conscious awareness. You know, what you decide to think about next is what you're attending to. So they think a model for how attention proceeds through time, how it evolves through time. It uses this word codelets. The idea is that attention evolves not by a certain decision-making process or rules, but by an evolution or an emergent process 
where lots of little agents operate more or less independently, and then they form coalitions. They say, well, you and I, you know, the flower and the shade is kind of in that direction. Together, they steer me in that direction. Now the flower is a little bit brighter. So you gradually evolve toward whatever decision you make through the interaction of small little pieces of, of decision making, no large, large scale big decision. And that's all I'm going to say about LIDA, because this idea was really inspired, this idea of codeless was inspired by another cognitive architecture called Copycat, and it was elaborated in an architecture called Metacat. So this is by Douglas Hostetter, the guy who wrote Colonel Asher Bach, and his students, Miller and Mitchell, James Marshall. And the central focus of this line of research is about analogy. The idea is that the way we think, in many cases, we think about new things in terms of things we already know. We make analogies. So, for example, taxes. We could say, taxes are like leeches. They suck the blood out of the system. You might say, taxes. Taxes are like vegetables. You don't always like to swallow them like they're good for the body. Anything else. So, which analogy do you believe? So the idea of analogies is that they're not always baked in. They're creative. You think of your problem, and you think of some associations of analogy, and you try to find a mapping between them. It's a creative process. So copycat is an attempt to understand the, the process of developing creative analogies. The Hoff Center designed a toy problem <coughs> called the letter string analogy task. So it's, very, it's a toy problem, but it's actually very, very interesting, and it's hard to solve. So we're going to do this problem. The idea is this, that you, you have this pattern. You say that ABC, some pattern, maps to some, through some transformation to another pattern. ABC maps to ABD. Okay, given that pattern, what does this pattern, MRRJJJ, map to? What's the analogy there? M R R K K K. That's a good one. Anything else? M R R J K D. M R R J K D. All right. So there's lots of answers, right? So let's take our break now. We're going to do an exercise. So what I want you to do is we're going to take a little bit harder one. I want you to study this one. A B C goes to A B D. What does X Y Z go to? E. So there's a lot of possible answers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take 10 minutes. And um, so you can go out of the room. But I want you to talk to your neighbors. Often we are more creative when we can bounce ideas off of someone else. So find your neighbors, talk to them. And I want every group to come up with three answers and explanations why. So in 10 minutes at um, 835, we're going to come back and we're going to consider what our answers are to this question. All right, X, Y, Z goes to what? Well, I have three solutions, but I'm not sure which one is correct. First one is, I think, X, Y, 8. X, Y, what? 8, 8, number 8. eight. Number 8? Yes, because you are focusing on English processing, right? I'm sorry, 8 is not in the character set. I <laughs> 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 said that. It has to be a letter in the outside. So it is X, Y, Y, R, X, Z, Z. All right, so you're saying X, Y, Z, Z? Yes. Okay. And why is that? Because, no, 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 X, Z, Z. X, Z, Z. Sorry. All right, X. Z, Z, Y. Because we don't have next immediate level after Z, so we can consider next letter. Next letter is Y, so Y. All right, so here's, so let me see if I can understand your model. You're saying, we want to advance that one. We can't advance that one, so we got to advance the next one. Anybody else have that answer? Okay, very creative, thank you. Another answer. W, Y, Z. W, Y, Z. Why? So if you put whole alphabet on the same line, and then you look at the symmetry, yeah. 
ABCD would trigger WYZ. Okay, so you're kind of flipping it over. So W, so this this corresponds to the C, this A, B, C. A, B, C. Uh, a, B, C, and then you're advancing the, this, this letter here. Okay, anybody else get that answer? A bunch of people got that answer, okay. Um, all right, another, another answer. In the back. In the back. Yeah, it's, um, it's Y, A. X, Y, A, okay. Why X, Y, A? Because it's circular. And then it's circular. Will... Yeah, and then it follows the pattern of A, B, B. Okay, so what comes after Z is A, because that's it's just a circular alphabet, not coming to the end of the alphabet. Very good. Yes? X, Y, Y. X, Y, Y. Y. Okay, so you bounce off the end. You, you've got to the end of the alphabet, so now you go back, go back the other way. It'll work our way back on. Very good. Does it have to be a character like ABC? Yes. Something else. No, it has to be a character of the alphabet. Sorry. So it has to be an alphabet. Alphabetic character. Yes. X Y D. X Y D. Why? Just bring the D down. <laughs> <laughs> Very simple rule. You know, always replace a third letter with a D. Very good. Do you have uppercase or lowercase? No uppercase, lowercase. They're all lowercase. Yes. Yes. Why A A? Why is that? Um, All right, we're starting another round of the alphabet, second level. X Y Z can't go on. X Y Z, you just you're stuck. Yeah. You can't go on. All right, we're coming to the end. Of that one. My fiber, my fiber. <laughs> A, B, D. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that's what he has to Always the answer. That's a very stable attractor. Okay. So you can say this is a very creative process, right? There's more than one answer. So let's let's see how Copycat solves this problem. All right, so it's got an architecture. The architecture of copycat. It doesn't really have a perception action loop because there's no input to this, but there is a cycle. It's got a, uh oh. It's got a, a workspace right here. So this is where the content of current thinking is. And for the knowledge, it's got something corresponding to the knowledge base. That's called the slip net. And then instead of production rules, it's got this thing on the side here called a code rack. And those are these little codelets, little pieces of transition or computing that are watching the workspace and deciding, OK, can I contribute to the workspace? So they're operating effectively, independently. And they're also watching this, the state of the slip net, which is uh, an activation, which corresponds to some sort of beliefs or activation about what's relevant to the thing on the workspace. So the code, the code rack, instead of having exact rules, um, each one of these codelets computes how likely is it to be the applicable codelet to run next? How desirable is it? How much weight does it have? So it makes a distribution, probability distribution, over which one should fire next. And each one does a little bit of work. And I'll show you in a second what that work is. But it can be things like building a group, saying that these three letters form a group, or testing out, what if I advance the next letter? So the idea here is that the workspace has got some current content, and there's some activation in the slip net. And this distribution is uh, the next code to fire fires at random, but it, according to the probability distribution. So if this one fires, then that's the direction that subsequent structure is going to be built on. If this one happens to fire, then it will kind of go in that direction for a while. 
but then it, it might be overtaken by this one over here, and then this one will take over. But that's a, a distributed way for an emergent process of multiple small amount of work to build on one another to drive the think the computation for certain hypotheses. We'll see the workspace in a minute when I run um, uh, Metacat. But let's look at this slip net next. The slip net is what we acknowledge by so now. What do we know about this domain? So it's got these uh, nodes, these, these objects, like you've got the objects, which are the letters, and these relations, which are like, what's a successor letter, the predecessor letter, whether it comes before and, and, and after. Now notice that in this, in their definition of the slip net, they say that when you get to the Z, you're being, there's no circling back to the A. So they probably would not entertain a solution that says we're cycling around, given this, this, this design of the knowledge. There's also um, colits that form groups, like groups like a predecessor, ABC or CBA, or uh, same, sameness groups if all the letters are the same. And then there's um, string positions, the leftmost, the rightmost, the left and the right. This gives you an idea, you can study this if you read the paper. This gives you an idea of the kind of knowledge that's maintained. And as a thing operates, some of these concepts are considered to be more likely or more important in our current view of the problem. And they'll contribute to which codelets uh, get which activation. So um, what I'm going to do is run it. And did anybody here get a look of any cat You did? Did you run it? But I don't have a Java. Oh, you need Java. I don't know how this works. OK. So anyway, I'm going to run it here. Here's a screenshot of what, what we're going to see. We're going to see um, the workspace. The slip net activation and some other things. So let me exit out of here. And now I have to set up. So I put in the problem ABC, APD, MRR, JJJ. We'll do X, Y, Z in, in a little while because this one usually solves a lot faster. <coughs> so the workspace has our initial problem state, and I'm just going to say go. We're going to let this thing run. Now, what it's showing us. Is how it's forming intermediate state structures, like it formed a bond between an association between C and JJ. It made a group of these two, not yet a group of all three. It might make it, oh, look, it turned out into a group of three J's in a row. So, okay, that's a nice structure. It might make a link from there to there. It's looking for, oh, it found a link between this R, this group here, and the B. Meanwhile, the slip net is saying, okay, middle, identity, directions. Um, it's changing its weights, and the code rack, I'm not seeing the code rack. Let me get that up there. And here. The code rack, here it is. This is fun to see that little codelets change their activation weights as it looks for a, for a solution. So it thinks it's got some good associations. Now all I have to do is figure out, okay, um, what do I do? What's the transformation that turns whatever this thing is associated with its D? I think it's going to make it go a little bit faster. <coughs> Close. Um, so, oh. Looks like it's going to be going backwards. It's grouping those together. That gives a very different answer. That's right. So one of the one of the, the properties of the system is that if you because it is it's stochastic, non-deterministic, it does give you different answers different times you run it. And you could you might be able to run it multiple times and count how many times different answers come out. And that might give you an idea of which, which might be more popular solutions or less popular solutions. So it's, it looks like it, it, it was getting close and then it got stuck and now it doesn't know what to do. We'll give it a couple of minutes. If it, doesn't, if it doesn't solve, then we might restart it or I can, uh, I'll show you some screenshots when it found solutions. Uh, I can tell you that when I read it, and while it's going, I'm going to show you a screenshot of what it one of the solutions it found for it, uh, a solution it found for X, Y, Z earlier, I read it today. It found one of the ones you guys found, which was X, Y, W, 
And so this, this x here means that it did exactly what you said. It said, we're going to flip this around, view it from the, the, the analogy between going forward, going backward means that the left end becomes the right end. We're going to, we're going to um, advance um, one of those. So, but it does find other solutions um, to this one as well. Yeah. It, it has a way of evaluating whether it likes the solution in terms of um, some internal measures of um, is there compatibility of the concepts. So each concept, like is there, um, you know, it would say that if you have a group mapping to a single character, is it possible to advance that group and advance that character? And if you can't advance it, then that says, well, maybe that's not a good group or not a good mapping. But if there's no other choice, it'll do that. So there are internal criteria that it uses to decide when it's, when it's done. Well, I have a question. Yes. So you started with the, uh, the problem statement on making an analogy. Yes. It's a far simpler than making an analogy because this can be represented with a graph. In reality, see, you may imagine <coughs> man to an animal, and then the combination sort of almost defined, and it's very difficult to well, in, in fact, in artificial intelligence, there's a fair amount of work on using on analogies and reasoning by analogy. And one of the one of the uh, uh, properties of some of the other work is they try to expand to larger systems, not just a toy example like this, but full world knowledge graphs, knowledge bases. And they'll say, um, yeah, you can make analogy from a person to an animal. Because you can find correspondences. So part of the, the problem of analogy, which, which is exemplified here as well, is you find some parts that look like they correspond to one another. And then you see some other parts that's not a clear correspondence. And you say, well, what would be the, uh, the correspondence if you extended it further? So that process can be done for larger systems than just this, this toy problem. And what this problem is, is, is examining is the, the reasoning or the process of searching that that is the space of many possible analogies. And you're right, there, it's very creative. Um, it's a very creative process to decide what's a good analogy. Does it map well? Do I believe it? What would it, where would it take me? Okay. I guess my, my question is uh, using the modern computing power, is that sufficient to <coughs> drive that complex system to draw an analogy, like a generic analogy? Somebody spit out a sentence there, you know, make an analogy to the sentence. Can you, is it possible? Yeah. Um, well, our minds do it, and um, it depends on what the architecture is and how it's implemented. So, in theory, people think it can be done. Yeah, sure. um, what kind of inputs do you need to give it so that it can make sense of this? Um, and let me give you an example. So, we have ABC going to ABD. If I were to change that question to 1, to 3, to say 1, 4, 9, which is square. Yes, yeah, square. Would it be able to find out or be a different set of inputs to be given? Uh, you need a different vocabulary and a different set of concepts. So that slip net I showed, yeah. you'd have to have representations for numbers, for relations between numbers, for operations you can perform on numbers, you know, the concept of multiplying. Here the concept is I can take the successor or predecessor. But you can make that bigger in terms of, oh, I can multiply, I can divide, I can add numbers. And you can make the search space bigger, but then it becomes harder to solve. But if you read the Hofstadter, he, that, that's actually part of what inspired him. So he's certainly thought beyond that. But, but you can find it to a yeah. point to a problem to explore um, the reasoning that this is about. We need to keep that data in. Yeah, you have to. So in this case, this is not learned. This is actually handcrafted knowledge. Yes. Okay. So is the way that a load or a Google actually take the data is it should be the source or protocols or maybe data and ask us to generate new data? Um, yeah. Can you generate, can you apply general knowledge bases to some of these reading systems? That's part of the research that is being done. Yeah. I'm asking because in the 80s, somebody analyzed the patent database and looked at the trade-offs. He says, let's say, we are using uh, color uh, and temperature as a trade-off between viscosity of material and, let's say, the brightness. Place. And he 
you find a certain sort of part that is an engineering table uh, where he says, okay, if you want to solve this problem, if you want to maximize uh, output of your, let's say, and, and brightness of your display, you have to reduce the viscosity and you have to sacrifice uh, the small size, for example. And the innate is the one trying to make the table. But I've never heard like, uh, this completely because it was a good thing. Well, there's, that gets into the question of how is a knowledge represented and what knowledge are you trying to combine? Are you trying to do a simple optimization that you can formulate in a box? You use a mathematical process to, to, to solve it? Or are you trying to be creative, put together a lot of different concepts in a general sense to maybe answer some general physics problem? So I should say that's, you're, you're ready to start reading papers and, and, and research in AI. Those are good questions. Yeah, though so people are really seriously questioning you know, things like that. This is interesting. It hasn't found a solution yet. I'm going to, I'm going to bail out of here because we, we had, we're almost out of time, and I want one more concept. But I'll just show you the. Um, let me just show you the answer that they got earlier about um, the MR, uh, the MRRJJ. What I read earlier, um, they like this solution, MRRJJ. <coughs> Somebody. Somebody said that right at the beginning. All right. So it's, it's fun to run it. You can download it and run it yourself. So I, I highly recommend it. And it does require installing Java, but um, it's not that. All right. So we have one more topic I want to lead, lead into, which is architecture, getting back to cognitive architecture, and conversational agents. So conversational agents are AI that is very is among us right now. It's very interesting. And in particular, let's focus on conversation agents like Alexa or Google Home that answer a question. Now, next week, we're going to talk a lot more about question answering and um, all of natural language processing and natural language understanding. But here, I want to focus on architecture. So this thing is very smart. I can say Alexa, who won the 1934 World Series. That gives me the answer. The St. Louis Cardinals beat the Detroit Tigers 4-3 in the 1934 World Series. That's pretty smart. So what's the architecture of a thing that can do this? Well, here's the architecture of a conversational agent. And you'll recognize it. It's a perception action loop. So the input comes in here. There's some thinking that goes on, and then the answer comes out the other side. So it's got these stages of processing. So there's automatic speech recognition that makes words out of the speech. Natural language processing turns that into it's called a logical form or some computer representation of the meaning of the question. Then the dialogue manager decides, well, how do I evaluate that meaning and come up with what the answer is? In terms of a logical form, this gets converted back into words through natural language generation and through text-to-speech that gets um, the spoken response that you hear. So this, um, this Perception action loop, is this reactive or deliberative? Deliberative? Deliberative. <coughs> All right, so the answer is it's mixed. This part down here, speech recognition, is done these days by neural networks. Pretty straightforward. So this can be much more reactive. Also, the speech, the text of speech. But you're absolutely right. Once we get up to the dialogue manager, that's all makes us make choices. Well, what's the right answer to who won the 1934 World Series? Where should I look? The database is the right one. So that's deliberate. The natural language processing has got both deliberate and reactive steps in it, most often. So the dialogue manager is where these the knowledge resources get appealed to. And there's some data, some knowledge out there about the World Series. So this architecture maps nicely onto our cognitive architecture. Perception action loop. Speech comes in. There's some place in the dialogue manager where it says, what's our current question? It goes out to the knowledge resources to find the answer. So these things are very smart, but why are they so dumb? I can say, Alexa, who won the 1934 World Series? Gives me the answer. How about you ask a follow-up question? Alexa, who was the president then? This might answer your question. The president of the United States is Donald Trump. 
So that's not very smart. I mentioned, I said the word then, I'm referring to a word that Alexa just told me, 1934. We're talking about 1934. So what's wrong with this thing? It can't even maintain a, a conversation over multiple terms, even under one term, and keep in mind the context of what we were just talking about. So what this tells us is that the cognitive architecture of this conversational agent is actually rather weak <coughs> in a particular spot. It's here, some sort of context memory of what were we talking about? <coughs> to take that into account in deciding what the level of resources are uh, to, to apply to answer my question. You have to forget, Alexa, this is very, very hard. Context is one of the hardest problems in all of artificial intelligence, in all um, intelligence in general. We're going to see that again next week when we talk about natural language. But that brings us back to the ingredients of intelligence. What context memory has to do is use knowledge representation, and that's what pattern matching is really good at. But what we don't know how to do is put the pattern matching together with our context memory, some sort of temporary memory in a workspace, and also to fill in the blanks, the reasoning. You know, what is it we were talking about? What would be an appropriate answer? When you say then, you know, maybe 1934, maybe there was a, a, a piece of the conversation before then. I was talking about 1912 a lot. Natural language understanding stands in the middle here, and cognitive architecture is really the branch of AI that tries to pull these things together. All right, so this moves into the last slide, the summary, and that's a taxonomy. How do we interpret intelligent beings? So we've got different kinds of intelligent beings. We've got natural intelligence and artificial intelligence, and maybe there's alien intelligence as well. We're not sure. We think that spaceships from outer space are alien intelligence that it exists, but we don't have much information about that. So we're natural intelligence, we have animal intelligence, and human intelligence. Artificial intelligence, we've got classical methods, like SOAR and production systems, and machine learning methods. And machine learning has got symbolic methods, which we didn't talk about, but there is machine learning beyond statistical methods. There are a lot of statistical methods, some of which we haven't talked about, but neural networks is the one that's getting all the energy these days, and especially deep learning, a branch of statistical machine learning that has made a big splash. So neural network architectures are here, and we see how neural network architectures compare with cognitive architecture. Cognitive architecture attempts to span all, all the way across to model human intelligence all the way <coughs> into artificial intelligence. And what I think we're destined to see in the next 10 years is that the weaknesses of neural network, neural network architectures will start to look to inspiration from cognitive architecture of having deliberative systems with a workspace and methods of choosing different paths to go in, of exploring a stage space. And at the same time, cognitive architecture definitely recognizes the advantages of neural networks and distributed processing, the kind of good pattern matching we can get up here. So these are destined to grow together. And I think that's what we're looking for. And you'll hear cognitive architecture on the period in 10 years a lot more than here now. OK, so now we're, we've got time for questions and discussion. So when you talk about cognitive architecture, then you have plants. Plants have a uh, response, so you have action, and you have response that don't follow the sound. Would you classify them as cognitive architecture or not? A plant, a plant is the most primitive reactive agent. So it's got an architecture, but it's very it's, it's not a cognitive architecture in the sense of a deliberate agent like SAR has. It's a very simple reactive system. As far as we know. A worm. A worm, uh, I, don't, I, I think a worm is pretty reactive as well. But it's a very interesting question. As you go up the animal uh, hierarchy, where, where does the animal become more deliberative? Does it have memory? Does it recall past, past situations? Certainly when you get to mammals and birds, they're very complex. And they, you know, they make decisions, they learn. So I'd say that they've got large elements of reactivity in their architecture. Are they reflective? Do they know about themselves and try to deliberately improve themselves? That's where you get to the top of the chain for humans really 
last point. Uh, we spent the last first few lectures looking at these the, 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 the latest techniques, neural networks, but uh, I think I agree with Eric, that's why I brought him here, is that uh, we're going to have to have a hybrid system to be able to sort of handle these common sense problems. And this part is actually not talked about that, that often. Um, and so I really do appreciate Eric to sort of uh, uh, give us the full embodiment of this uh, topic. So we'll see you next week. Um, uh, actually, not here. Not here. Good point. Thank you. We'll, we'll be at Bishop's Auditorium in uh, the Lathrop building, which is the old business school, those of you who, who know that architecture. But I'll, I'll put a note with a map on that as well. So no, do not come here. It'll be uh, Bishop's Auditorium. Thank you very much. I will